Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, students, friends of the university, my name is Alex Zarnas. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of the Built Environment. Uh, welcome to this building. Welcome to our campus. Thank you for coming. It's important for us. It's the launch of the Utzon Lecture Series. Uh, why Utzon? Well, because Jan was an alumnus and we many years ago supported Jorn through his trials and tribulations and of course the Opera House is a significant building in the world. And we think to name a lecture series in honour of this great contribution to this city gives a great deal of carriage around the world. But it's also important for us to say that it's an initiative that we hope demonstrates some of our important qualities, our leadership in academic uh, matters and our commitment to engaging with the community and giving something back to the community and as many of you know, we, we cover many disciplines and this lecture series is about those disciplines. It's about architecture, it's about design, and it's about planning, urban design, landscape architecture, construction, industrial design, property development. And we think that the integration of these things is vital to a better world through the interdisciplinary uh, nature of how we go about solving the, the enormous problems we face today. So it's also a forum for public ideas. It's a forum, we hope, that allows you to talk about what's happened, make friendships, and make connections, and actually help us help you. So we hope to discuss the big issues through, the, through this year, through every year. We invite you to let us know who you think should be part of this series. Uh, we invite you to all the other lectures in this series. Um, but I'm mostly here to tell you about tonight, and Jan, Jan just told me that the last time he was here, he was sitting an exam, and you all know what that's like. But I can say to you that my wife, Margaret, and I visited Denmark August, September uh, last year, and we went to the Bargsvard Church, just, well, in Cop just outside of Copenhagen. And of course, you know, it was a Sunday, and we arrived at about 12 o'clock, and it was summer and the sun was directly overhead, and all the doors were open in a beautiful blue sky, and there was nobody there, but we could go everywhere, and the organist was playing bark fugues, and of course, that extraordinary section in the building was alive, and everywhere we walked, it was my curse, because my wife kept on saying, why didn't we do this, and why didn't we do that, and I knew that she was right. But, but Jan was the project architect for that building, and of course, with his father, has been the project architect of many buildings, and including the Kuwait Assembly and many others. And in his own right, is making a significant impact in areas which you wouldn't imagine. Some of the most important uh, areas of, of an architect's working life can be in very poor areas, and, and Jan is working all through Africa and other uh, uh, areas with, where, with very serious uh, needs. So I, I don't need to really say much about Jan, we are grateful that he flew here to inaugurate this lecture series. Uh, we look forward to his comments and in impressions and insights on, on Jorn. Um, the, the format for this night is, is, is fairly straightforward. Jan will speak. We'll take some questions, and then Professor Richard Johnson will, will thank Jan and reflect on his talk. So thank you for coming again, and let me introduce Jan, Jan to you. Alec, and thank you everyone for turning up here today. It's amazing to be back at the University of New South Wales, which I attended a few years ago, admittedly. Um, and as Alex said, the last time I was here, I was sitting for some exams at the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, however, I will start off by telling you something about my father. And if I could have the first slide here, please. Um, my father, of course, did not uh, start uh, his work with the Opera House. Uh, even though he's so well known for that building, he started with humble beginnings uh, in a provincial town in, in Aalborg. And he's on the left with his two brothers and uh, came out of a family where the father was a, a, a 
shipping uh, engineer, naval engineer, educated in, in England. And he grew up uh, surrounded by the work that went on in the wharfs and saw how people with relatively simple tools and techniques could make these marvelous big ships, uh, freighters, uh, liners, etc. Um, he took his education in Denmark that happened during the war, the Second World War, and he got an opportunity to, to go to Sweden um, during the time when he met my mother and they are coming out of the church just, getting, just having gotten married. When after the war he came back, or we came back, I was there as well, came back to Denmark um, and there was nothing to do. Very little work, economy was poor, no material, no building materials, and everything was at a standstill. But he got some commissions like this water tower, I think he had something like $80 as a fee at the time. And he designed things, lamps, uh, furniture and so on, in, but also did a lot of competitions. But during that time, just after the war, uh, he applied for a scholarship, and which he got, which allowed him to travel for many months in the United States uh, and Mexico. Uh, where he met Franklin Wright, he stayed with Franklin Wright, he stayed with Ray and Charles Eames, he stayed with various other famous architects, met Miss van der Rohe and so on. And those people were extremely kind and generous um, to take all these, these young uh, couples in that came from Europe. Not many had been there yet. When he came back, he said, we're going to make this house and it's inspired by all the things that I've seen in the United States, a new way of open living. The houses at the time in Denmark were little square boxes with holes for windows and a, a saddle roof. And uh, he got through his work with exhibitions. He had these big posters of canvas that he got after exhibitions that he provided for, for some exhibitors. And he carted them out to a site in the forest and set them all up so that his parents and my mother's parents could come and see a full-scale model of this new house. Unfortunately, during the night, the wind came up and the whole thing blew up in the trees. But eventually, they built this house, which has a closed north wall, open glass-lined uh, south wall, and a flat roof, flat floor, floor heating, which was extremely uh, new in uh, Denmark and Europe at the time. Still not much work to do, he did a lot of competition work, uh, got some prizes, second, third prizes and so on, and uh, uh, won a prize in Sweden actually uh, for some uh, type of housing, uh, which later was built in Denmark uh, on varied and, and uh, rather nice sites. Then eventually there was this little notice in the Danish architectural magazine or paper, I don't know exactly, but about a competition in Australia. He participated and uh, seeing the photographs on the site, this peninsula sticking out in the harbor, he uh, thought of the nearby Kronborg Castle, which is also sitting on a peninsula, sticking out, not in the harbor, but out in the ocean, facing Sweden across the sound. And he said, something like Kronborg, when you move around it, it changes all the time. You see this roofscape. We need to have something like that in the center of the Sydney Harbor. Uh, and um, he then further from his inspiration, traveling in Mexico especially, he had this idea that when people walk up uh, a large staircase up on a plateau overlooking the forest as it were in Mexico, you suddenly get out, you are lifted out of your everyday life uh, to, an, to a new level. Because in Mexico, when you are on the ground, you have a flat terrain and you, have, you don't see very far because of the trees, but once you get above the tree level, you can see forever. And he had this idea that if I make a plateau where people wander up from their daily lives on top of that and meet the artists who perform the things that have been training underneath the plateau, that would be a wonderful uh, concept for an opera theater or performing arts center in Sydney. So he did the platform and some sketches uh, that showed some sails or shells covering uh, all the functions underneath. When he won the competition, uh, I was 12, I think, and uh, my sister, she 
ran to meet him when he got, got home from wherever he'd been and said, Daddy, Daddy, you won the competition for the opera house. I want a new horse. Oh, I want a horse. <laughs> so, easy, easy. <laughs> but of course, that event turned our lives completely around. And um, from having a lot of debt from building the house and not having work and driving around in his little old truck trying to get work everywhere, he suddenly had this work and, and the media focused on him and on uh, his office that he then established in Denmark. And we had uh, these wonderful tales of his visits to Sydney, uh, how he uh, went via Hawaii, for instance, and he got into a hotel and he opened the balcony and overlooking Waikiki Beach. And there was a whole crowd of people there cheering and waving and he said, it's amazing, how do they know? I mean, I did win the Opera House competition. And then he heard commotion upstairs and he was looking up, there was Elvis Presley just above him. <laughs> <laughs> but he brought, uh, he used his trips back and forth from Denmark to Australia because the first six years of the work here, uh, he actually lived and worked in Denmark with the staff and the engineers in England and later on we moved here. But he, he traveled to China, to Japan, to Nepal, to India, and in very many places where he picked up a lot of inspiration. Things he had seen in books while he was uh, a young architect in Sweden, but had never hoped to, to be able to see, but he knew where he wanted to go. Uh, while uh, the work was going on in Sydney, and that's a whole story uh, some of you have of course heard, but all the circumstances that fell into place that actually made this building happen, and the things that the Premier at the time, Joseph Kyle, initiated the construction without any plans or any construction documents even, uh, is probably what, what made the building, uh, or the result of that is that the building is here today. If everything had been planned, every, all the detail had been worked out, and the, and the subsequent price had been calculated, it would never have happened. But they were working in Denmark, and the base was relatively straightforward to make, but the shells turned out to be a major problem because my father's idea to have thin concrete shells would work only for a much smaller structure than was uh, necessary here. And another matter was that he wanted to cover the shells with white tiles, and if you have Shells that have a curvature that changes all the time, you cannot cover them in a pattern or anything that goes together with a square tile. And this is a full scale, scale mock-up. A lot of full scale mock-ups were made to try to find a solution for various problems. And I grew up with all this, of course, and it was very, at the time, it was just normal for me. But later on, I can see how unique that experience would have been or has been. But the factory that make the tiles actually make part of a shell, sort of, and found out they couldn't do it. And only when uh, my father got into thinking that if he uh, superimposed all these shapes onto a sphere of the same radius, then you can subdivide that. That's geometrically defined. You can just subdivide these shells. It does give the building a slightly different profile but actually a much more noble one, as we think. Um, and when we came to Australia in uh, the end of 62, uh, the construction site was something like this. My parents, uh, we all, uh, parents and three children, we flew uh, through various routes across the United States, to, uh, Hawaii, Tahiti, it wasn't too bad, coming down here. And uh, my parents, uh, as some of you have heard before, uh, we were traveling coach, and my father asked for some blankets and was told that you can't have blankets, it's only for first class passengers. And then a few hours later, uh, the stewardess came with some blankets and a telegram inviting my parents to come and have lunch at the Royal uh, Yacht Britannia with Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip when we arrived. So we were. At least, even if we weren't shifted to first class, we were mentally elevated somewhat. <laughs> um, well, going back to the shells, they could be subdivided. Uh, the bits and pieces that 
go together to make the cells were manageable of size and geometry. Um, the building site was a very exciting one. Um, I was at the time uh, just still not finished in high school, so my sister and I, we went to uh, Narabeen girls and boys school respectively. My brother, who was, he was starting in, in kindergarten up in, in Bayview. Uh, but later on, I, I uh, graduated from high school and I attended the School of Architecture here and was living in town in Paddington and ran around uh, the, the site very often talking to the people. I could go anywhere because at the time nobody cared about security or hat hats or anything like that. Even at night, it was a marvelous site uh, and, and place to be. And the interiors of the two halls, the major hall and the minor hall, that is the opera theater and the, the theater, a drama theater at the time, they were being equipped with stage towers and stage machinery uh, constructed and uh, brought from Vienna or from Austria. And uh, that was all growing up. And the structure as it, as it was when it was nearly completed with just the shells, nothing else, it was a marvelous place to be. The cladding began to, be, uh, began to come on, uh, of the exterior of the shells, and eventually the building looked pretty much like my father had envisaged, uh, but there was nothing inside it. This is, of course, a much later picture, but it does show the main uh, components of the Sydney Opera House, as my father envisaged. The podium, the shells, and later on the interiors. And incidentally, the competition projects, uh, when they, uh, they, the jury selected 10 different projects that they proposed for prizes, and they gave them to the quantity surveyor, and the quantity surveyor said, this is by far the cheapest because it's so simple. Uh, and he mentioned the figure of what corresponds to $7 million. Uh, it ended up by costing 110. Uh, and that was always a political issue later on, which I'll just touch upon later. But when the figures later on have broken down, 7 million were spent on the podium, another 12 on the shells. That's 19 million out of the 110 were my first responsibility. The remainder were used by the subsequent uh, construction team. Uh, during the shells uh, construction, of course, all the interiors were being planned. And my father's uh, affinity for breaking things down into elements. And uh, like when you have a field full of flowers, for instance, you see all the flowers going in different directions and you have different reflections from the sun on these flowers, and they give you a multitude of different hues and so on. He wanted the same effect to take place inside the building. Uh, so he worked with natural phenomena, trying to translate it into constructible pieces of equipment that could be brought on site and erected. Uh, the glass walls were one of these issues, and um, he used the mullions sitting outside in the glass uh, closer to our inside, so that the mullions would actually serve as a kind of Venetian blinds, not casting shadow on the glass, so you wouldn't get the heat build up. And also, all the panes of glass were the same, as opposed to today, you have all the panes of glass, they are different sizes. Uh, a very um, um, ingenious guy uh, here in Australia, Ralph Simons, had a, a plywood factory further up the river, and he could construct an entire railroad car out of one piece of plywood. And my father and he got to become very good friends, and he was really keen to be able to do some of all these structural elements out of plywood, bonded with metal of some kind, bronze, lead, and so on. And uh, unfortunately, he died rather early, but my father continued with Simon's factory uh, to uh, investigate the interiors, and um, these are all models of the ceilings that would go into the, very, the two venues. So the venues would have uh, plywood interior 
of the density that necessary and the ge geometry necessary for the perfect acoustics inside those venues. Uh, the decoration uh, was something else. My father liked uh, the idea that you could take the decoration for something you know and then cut it down and maybe you will have a ceiling that has some remnant of um, some sort of decoration that, that corresponds to something you see. Not necessarily an onion, of course, but this is just an illustration of that idea. Uh, at the time, in 65, uh, everything was going well, of course, apart from the normal bickering about costs going off and the time delays and so on. But it was a new structure, it was never tried before, and it was not easy to predict anything along those lines. The uh, Opera House Lottery paid for the lot. There wasn't any major problems, but it was being used as a political issue. So when there was a change of government, well, I'm just, uh, my father also had time to design the chain for the president of the Institute of Architects here. And some nice people had doubts about the opening of the Opera House, as they said, is taking a valid and unlikely event of the opening of our house in 1996. <laughs> but there was a change in government, there was a change of client. My father's client, who was the Opera House Committee, they were sacked or uh, became redundant, and the Minister of Public Works, he became my father's client directly. And um, the problem was that. Um, the new government had other ideas about what the house should be used for. They wanted to change the brief, they wanted to change the spaces that were going up, making the opera theatre into a concert hall. My father pleaded, could we just continue along the line where all this has been developed, and maybe if you want a concert hall, build it somewhere else. But alas, uh, that went on for a little while, and. Uh, he was not paid for a couple of months and he couldn't pay his staff, so he had to close his office and we left and the rest is history. There were a lot of you here, or rather than your predecessors, who went in uh, marches and it was quite a, an emotional time for the family, of course. My father didn't bring much of it home. We heard about it and we knew about it, but all the discussions went on uh, in the city. And suddenly, one day, uh, we were off to uh, northern shores, and my parents, they took a sail, so to speak. Um, but luckily, there were other jobs, like this uh, bank in uh, Tehran, in Iran, a project for a theater in Zurich, in Switzerland, where the committee consisted of elderly gentlemen, 75 and up, and uh, one died, a new one came in, I changed the brief, redid the project, and this happened about, what, six, seven times? Over six, as many years. And in the end, they decided they wanted to remodel the existing theater, which they found out six years previously they couldn't remodel. So it didn't, I mean, it never uh, became a building. My father was asked by an artist friend in Denmark, could you make me a museum for all the art I have that I want to give to the city. And uh, it was in a, in a site where there was an old uh, house, uh, heritage house, and my father said, can't we, let's dig it into the ground. Uh, you have the section here where you dig it into the ground, have ramps going down. It's a new way of looking at, at art, and new, new way, a new architecture around a new kind of art. That was the idea. It's very good, everything went well until the artist died and the city decided to use one of their own uh, architects to do the museum that's there today. Uh, we got a, a job. I was then at the School of Architecture in Copenhagen. I was partly involved in this. In a cave, like the Nolan Caves in the Blue Mountains, they used this as a theater for the, uh, for the citizens of Beirut in Lebanon. And there was just this access door uh, <coughs> the size of a normal door through the rocks, so you had to carry everything in, uh, on your shoulders. So we made a project where the bits and pieces were like aluminium ladders that could then be erected to this kind of bird cage that sat inside the, uh, the, the cave. So when 
they could then hang their different uh, acoustical adjustable ceilings or spotlights and so on. And you had the stage, and you had the audience around that stage, and the audience looked at what was going on on the stage and looked into the cave behind. You could light in different ways. And when the light was on in the cage, you would have geometric, uh, geometrically defined shape around you. But when they turned off the light in the cage and turned it on in the, in the cave instead, you looked through it like you do in a thin uh, curtain. He did a number of furniture, a series of furniture, some of which were made and produced, some of which weren't. Um, and then he got this job <coughs> for a church in Barsford that Alec has just uh, mentioned. Um, and I just completed my studies at the time at the School of Architecture and graduated, and I was in on this project. Uh, it consists of two long walls, 17 meters apart, and between those uh, precast elements on both sides, there are two uh, surfaces up there that are actually cast in place. And between those two, you have an undulating ceiling of thin, 10 centimeter thick concrete, which is curved in such a way it corresponds to a sheet of paper that cannot carry between my two hands. It will hang down like that. But when you fold it and put it back, it, the folds will actually make it strong. Uh, going back a little bit, uh, that's a, the folders uh, slabs in the ceiling, and you have the ceiling and the space itself. There was no more work at this time, so my parents uh, moved to Hawaii, and my father got a, a, a position as a teacher at the School of Architecture in the University of Honolulu for some years. And I'll just return for a minute to our childhood where my father and mother, they encouraged all sorts of, uh, of curiosity in us kids. And uh, my, I remember when my father, he found out I was very interested in model airplanes as any little boy is at one stage. Uh, he went to the, like Kingsford Smith's airport, he went to the Castro Airport in Denmark and got into the stores and got a lot of um, spare parts for planes, a seat and a window, an engine from a rotary engine, or just a part of it, a lot of instruments and things like that, and filled up his station wagon. I had all that for Christmas, and that was fantastic as a boy. <laughs> to see all these things, you could take apart and put back together again. And um, as that seemed to go well, and I was getting to the stage where I wanted them, one of these little motorbikes you can get when you turn 16, uh, they didn't want me to, to go that way because my mother's father was a surgeon. He had treated so many motorbike accidents. So he said, never let your kids have motorbikes. And uh, he knew, my father knew my affinity for mechanical things. So if he saw in an ad, they had, the Danish Air Force had planes for sale. So he bought one and had it shipped to, the, to our garden. So then I had an entire airplane to take apart, <laughs> <laughs> which was very good. I mean, <laughs> you learn a lot of things from doing that and putting it back together again. <clears throat> He, they also took us traveling a lot. I mean, not only on our travels here, but early on we went with them to Spain, to uh, Italy, to France, uh, and it was always, we were always looking at things that excited my father. So, and we always heard about the people who excited my father, Frank Lloyd Wright, Lin Yu Chang, a, a Chinese uh, philosopher, and thoughts from China. Pictures everywhere, China, Japan, and so on. And not really thinking about it, I suppose by osmosis, I've gotten all of that information to me. I was still very much um, curious and uh, interested in mechanics. Uh, at one stage, I wanted to be become an uh, aeronautical engineer, but I knew also that if I became one, I'd probably be asked to do the tail, tail wheel assembly or something like that. Uh, whereas in architecture, you are more likely to get uh, to do everything. And when we travel across from Europe to Australia, we, among other things, visited um, Ray and Charles Eames, but we also visited Atelier and West, which was a base for Frank Lloyd Wright at the time. And I think when I saw that, I said, well, if this is architecture, 
then I would like to become an architect. Because in the town of Elsinore, which I normally saw, there was nothing really remotely enticing me to, to go that way. Um, sorry, uh, my father did a number of different projects in Denmark. Uh, at the time, I was involved in some of these, a petrol station, for instance, uh, even a telephone booth, just to take a smaller <laughs> project, uh, a, f a factory in Portugal, where the CEO of the factory and the CEO of the mother company in Germany took a ride in the CEO of Germany's new Mercedes and unfortunately killed himself, and that stopped that project. Did some uh, housing that could be put together as, uh, as a kit, which was popular until uh, a while. the idea was that you had bits and pieces you could just bolt together. Floor, ceiling, and add on walls as you needed, and you could combine these to make a house. And it went well for a while, but the delivery time was such in getting the elements that you could build a normal house anyway. Uh, I did some projects in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, a new stadium. Uh, it wasn't built. We were then invited. My father was in 1970, 71, in, in uh, Hawaii teaching. And I was living in the house at the time. And got a, uh, a letter as inviting us to participate in a competition for a new national assembly in Kuwait. I wrote to my father, it was still the time where you had aerograms and letters, there's no facts, there's nothing like that. And he said, well, let's do it. And uh, he got in contact with one of his old employees from the job here in Sydney, uh, a Turkish architect who had been with him for many years, who was present at that time working for another architect in London. And uh, the three of us then made the project. My father made concepts. My mother uh, redrew all the drawings, his sketches, because he's a commercial art artist by profession. And they sent a copy to me and a copy to the architect in England. He did the drawings, I did the models. And we I got it all together, sent it to Kuwait, and we were lucky enough to get that commission and based on that, the work of the three of us, of my mother as well, got four. Um, it was based on very simple things. Uh, the program was taking, the program was make something like the United States building or the United Nations building in New York. So I got a program of that, and we broke it down into rooms of certain sizes. Uh, made those rooms around courtyards uh, of different sizes. We had the assembly hall, we had the presentation rooms uh, for the king and so on. Uh, and all of that had to go into a building, which was arranged uh, within a courtyard in, in the Islamic way of doing things. Um, and that was eventually uh, then built out of prefabricated concrete elements because that was the only way we could ensure a relatively uniform quality throughout the construction. The other construction we saw down there, one corner of the building was great and the other corner was terrible. So here are a few photos of that and the huge concrete elements that actually went into the construction of this. Uh, the French company Fresine did those two roofs that are special, but the rest was done locally. And all these elements were then put up and the holes were filled up with concrete block work. The big roof that overlooks, it's a covered, covering a square to create shadow on the forecourt of the National Assembly for the Emir or the King to come out or the Minister to come out to speak to the, or the public so they can be in the shade. That was the idea. Um, some of the elements were so big they had to be cast up there. So on the left hand side you have actually what is in effect a concrete tube that's bent, uh, which is cast in, in, in the spot and then shifted sideways and parked on the, left hand, on the right hand side of the picture. And they weigh about 500 tons each. And I remember I was a site, uh, not site engineer, but I was site super, supervisor at some stage. And you walked around there and suddenly you had this whoop and this big lump of steel lands next to you. And you say, oh, well, oh, that, a helmet wouldn't have done any good anyway. 
uh, there's a man standing in the center underneath it. It's a completely uh, ridiculous piece of building, actually, but it makes the whole place. It wasn't in the program, but my father said they must have something, some covered square. Uh, and they said, OK, it's a part of the architecture. Well, let's build it. It doesn't matter what it costs. Uh, he even designed our boat. Uh, he'd been helping his father, the, the naval architect, to design his boats, uh, which he did as a hobby. Uh, so when he wanted a, a larger boat, we had a, a catamaran. And here in Sydney, we had a, an open day sailor. But then when we got back to them, I said, oh, let's, let's make a boat. And uh, he had a design for that. And it's unusual in the sense it looks normal from the front, but it's a catamaran at the rear. Uh, and I made the drawings and the big models that we raised against one another on a lake. And after seven different ones, uh, uh, we had it made in aluminum. I still sail that around. Uh, my parents, uh, they felt Hawaii was too far away, but they liked the climate here in Sydney, of course. And they liked the nature, and they were really sad to have to leave. Uh, so they tried to find somewhere in Europe where you had a Sydney-like feeling, and Mallorca fit the bill, in the sense that it's a sandstone uh, island. It has some of the same kind of vegetation, the same climate, the same sun, and so on. And it's only two and a half hours flight from Denmark, so it's very easy to. So they bought a piece of land, an awkward piece of land uh, on the Mediterranean coast, facing Africa. Uh, and it's sitting about 18 meters above the water level on sandstone rock. And since the site was so narrow, the road is down here in the lower part of the picture. Uh, he, my father broke it up into little buildings. And because of the climate, you can just walk from one building to the other. So one on the left is just a, a bedroom and a terrace, a bathroom. And then the next one is two bedrooms, bathroom, then a living room, and then a, a patio with a kitchen and dining. And uh, they only worked when one of us was there. I was there often, staying in a rented house. And I came across this strange hole in the floor. It turned out that they misread the plants. But as an architect, you often, time, uh, you often draw furniture on your plants. <laughs> and this was a table. <laughs> but the living room, um, my father had seen niches in old medieval buildings, and he quite liked those. So he made these niches that actually has the effect that the harsh Mediterranean sunlight, which is not unlike the light here sometimes of the year, was filtered. So it, it, the transition from outside and in, to inside was much more pleasant with these niches. And this idea was tried here. And that window just shows the sun in that position about 10 minutes every day. But the same are the basis for the renovation of the Western Fire here at the Opera House was uh, these niches. And that entire house is made from sandstone. We got some projects for the Copenhagen the, uh, total development where, of course, we were only allowed to do a few of the buildings. Some projects that were never completed or never done. Some, uh, there's a concert hall and theater in uh, a provincial town in Denmark. Uh, it's all covered in the same tiles as the Sydney Opera House. They're still in production. And uh, <clears throat> it was a, it's a multi-purpose hall. And the way we've done it is that we have the entire ceiling, uh, several, uh, what do you call it? divided into elements similar to these. But if you can imagine these parts of the ceiling could be hoisted up and down. You can actually create the space and the volume that you need for either the theatrical uh, performances or concert performances. So we can increase the volume if we want it, or we can decrease it. Um, so this is part of that. You can see the floats in the ceiling and some performance going on, or trials for performance. And the sloping surfaces had this effect, not unlike the Opera House, that they reflect the sky and throw it to you, whereas a vertical wall doesn't do this. So you actually see it changes color throughout the day. Uh, projects in the northern part of Denmark, a visitor center for the showing people what the nature is like up there, uh, came our way. Straightforward buildings construction, 
overlooking uh, the nature because Denmark grows about eight meters north every year from sand that's uh, shifted all the time. I don't know when it hits Norway, but it'll take a while. Take a while. A cultural center uh, comprising of some restaurants, theater, museums, uh, concert hall, um, ballet school, and so forth in, in the city of Helsingborg in Sweden. Uh, another project in Aalborg, which was not to be. Uh, a showroom for a factory which we designed in, in, in Shanghai, and the offices are next door. Of course, there are these projects, all or these pictures represent projects that, that could, I could talk about for ages, but I won't do that. This is in Mexico, uh, out in the middle of nowhere, uh, really is, uh, on the Pacific coast, it's not too much south of uh, San Diego, it's about five hour drive, very dry. And the, the structure is about 650 meters long, just to give you an idea of the scale. And it's a convention center where you normally have a building that has all these rooms inside. Here, the site was so vast, so we just put, we would take every room and create the room that we wanted and place it on a plateau and uh, create this environment that you would walk around. And so just the size, if, as an expression of the size, is that we brought we bought in Mexico 30,000 square meters of travertine. And the roofs also with the Mexican tradition in mind, or the Hispanic tradition in mind of covering with colored tiles. And a small project actually in Geraldtown uh, in Western Australia for a scientific visiting center, which may or may not happen. Uh, in Africa, many of those, these projects uh, have come at a later stage where my father uh, have been in on this in the terms of discussions with me. Should we do this? Should we do that? But I've been the project architects and dealing with all these people that where we construct and I travel to Africa and I stay in a tent and live with them for a while and make drawings on the spot. But uh, for instance, this is a headquarter for a hum humanity organization in Zimbabwe, uh, simply built uh, by local non-skilled labor, uh, concrete block work rendered, painted, and we got some tiles stick on as decoration. Uh, but it, it has a nice feel to it when you walk around there with the courtyards and the open spaces, the shaded areas where they hold the meetings and so on. Um, corrugated steel roofs, for instance. Some other places there will be corrugated cement roofs. Uh, a simple village, uh, very cheap, $75 a square meter. But still, I mean, these people didn't have a house, uh, a roof over their heads and a place to cook and a place to assemble and so on. And even the giraffes, they like it. <laughs> they come up there. <laughs> and. Uh, this last one was from Zimbabwe. This is from Malawi. Uh, it's a teacher training college. And the, the girls are on the right and the boys are on the left. And the teachers are on the left and the classrooms are in between. So it's sort of segregated that way. And this is in Mozambique. It's also in the middle of nowhere, a small university based on my first project uh, back in the late uh, late 60s for a shopping center in Denmark, which was inspired by Islamic architecture. Here, the different functions and buildings are lying like ships up to a pier, where the pier is a, a winding uh, corridor, if you will, but very large and open in the sides. Uh, so you have this um, simple structure, but giving you a wonderful a uh, place to wander around and talk to your colleagues, and uh, they have outdoor classes and so on. And the walls will eventually be with the vegetation. Uh, and they, for the inauguration, they said 1,000 people in the center part. And uh, you just need shade in that kind of climate. And one of the halls, um, also inspired from a, an earlier project I did together with my father, where we have these deep niches that also allow the modulation of the light. And here I use 
one of the guides here has a beard. <laughs> um, my first life's work was done in Denmark because um, an, an English architect who was working in my father's hometown where he grew up in Aalborg, he had the idea that he would like to uh, use the university as a place where the new students of architecture could learn about, of course, architecture, but also about my father's method and approach to architecture and his sources of inspiration and so on. He asked my father, could you design such a center for us? It would be great to have your building as part of the university in that old city where you grew up. And my father agreed to this, so uh, this is uh, the, the last part of the work, and uh, the actual work was done in my brother's office in Copenhagen. Which brings me back to the time in 1909 where the government of New South Wales and the Sydney Opera House Trust were kind enough to ask my father whether he would uh, come back or consider coming back to work for the Opera House, because after so many years, use the Opera House is like an airport or an old hotel. It gets worn. Uh, things need to be changed from, for just for wear and tear, or things need to be changed because life is different today. And uh, the people at the Trust at, the mo at that time, 10 years ago, said, if we get Utsam back, uh, then perhaps when we spend the money, we can slowly, by increments, change whatever we do inside the building to fit more with the outside of the building as it was intended, and that was the idea. My father said yes, provided that you would accept my son, Jan, uh, as the person who actually travels to Australia and is the person between me and the people in Sydney. And the committee or the trust accepted this. So I've been the lucky architect to have been here since 1999, three or four times a year, uh, dealing with the Opera House and dealing with all the wonderful people that at the Opera House and the craftsmen and so on. And of course, uh, we could not do this from Denmark unless there was a local architect. And uh, JPW Architects with Richard Don Johnson was appointed the local architect. And uh, Richard Johnson came to Denmark and talked to my father and uh, he and I went back here and I recorded everything. We went, I went back to my father so he could see everything on video and photos and so on. But he said, I don't really need it. I have everything in my mind. Because as a creator, of course, he knew how things were, how, how things came together, what, the reasons behind things that happened at the Opera House. But it's been a wonderful collaboration with Richard Johnson, whom we will meet later. And uh, for me, it was a fantastic opportunity to come back and work at the Opera House. And what do we do? Um, of course, we have to make some sort of documentation of what's there, how it should be treated in the future, and all of this was done in, in various documents, which resulted in the World Heritage listing some years ago. Out of that sprang a number of projects, because a lot of things, when you walked around, uh, at least to the architect's eye, are not as they should be when you consider this World Heritage building. And, uh, when you look up above the holes between the shells, you see all these uh, sheets stuck together with duct tape and things like that. And, and fences put up so people can't climb the shells and think, little bits and things like that that we really want to get rid of and, and shine up and make the building uh, blossom as it should. Uh, the um, reception hall, as it was called at the time, was originally intended as a uh, con uh, what do you call it, a chamber music venue. And it had been uh, used well over the years, and it was an isolated space that we perhaps could do something to. And uh, we changed it with the floor, the ceiling, and decorations, and everything. But it all came about. My father he did some design uh, based on a picture of Raphael. He made a sketch that had the same feeling also based on some music by Bach. And my father's then exploring this further, making cutouts and paper and so on, um, which resulted in a tapestry which is hanging there today, which was uh, woven at the uh, Victoria 
tapestry works near Melbourne. Uh, also, because of the change of the opera theater into a concert hall, the spaces below the, this concert hall were not to be used as rehearsal rooms or stage equipment uh, um, space and so on. Uh, so three venues had been made, the playhouse, the studio, and the drama theater. And to have a foyer for those, a space had been vacated uh, for air conditioning equipment that had been put on the ground. But on the left-hand side, you had this wall that you probably all know, uh, which completely closed the view to the outside. You could be anywhere in this space. Uh, it, it didn't have to be the opera house, but you had no feeling for the wonderful location you were actually at. So my father said, let's open this wall. And it's difficult because we don't want to take away the, solidity, the visual solidity of the base of the upper house. Uh, so what he said is, if we make it a shadow instead, that's what you find in the headlands. You have the strata of sandstone, you have shadows, shadow lines, and you don't see the glass. Thereby, we can actually use uh, the change of those spaces into venues, into a foyer, to our advantages, and create something new for the opera house. Uh, so we created this colonnade, put windows in the, in the wall, in the western wall. Uh, the windows are actually mounted in exactly the same manner as the windows were mounted outside the niches in the house in Mallorca that was built in 91, 95, something like that. And now you have a, a, a western foyer that's much more in contact with the outside world and the view of the wonderful harbor and the harbor bridge beyond. The big issue has also been the opera theater. Uh, initially, as we went through the building, we said, what can we do to the opera theater, for instance? We didn't do anything or haven't planned to do anything to the concert hall. It seems to work. People are happy about it. There are some minor issues that can be solved to a certain extent anyway. But the opera theater has failings and it hasn't got the, enough volume. It's uh, very much opposed to my father's idea of having a festive space. It's all black inside. And uh, there are many other issues. It'll take too long to get into here. But my father then tried to, uh, to see if, just by adding color, if we could do something to the existing space. And he's here in Mallorca with the colors behind him that he tried out. And he always tried to make things as close to real life size as possible because he says, a little drawing, it doesn't tell me anything. We, we often put drawing paper on the windows at home. You remember the large glass uh, facade I showed initially? And that thereby saying, OK, we, ha we have to have a, a, a balustrade or something up to a certain height. Should we put it up here or down here? When we sit down, we should be able to look out. And we actually taped it up and so we can see what it would feel like when we're there. And out of all this, trial and error, which my father loved to do, uh, came a good solution eventually. And unfortunately, uh, if, at the end, my father said, we can't do anything to the, opera, the present opera theater. There's no way we can uh, create a world-class opera theater out of what's there now. We need, we need to do something drastic. And the idea has then been and is that to get the right volume to get the acoustics needed for this for these type of performances. We cannot go up. We cannot get out. We cannot go out. We can't make it larger that way. The only way we can do it is by lowering the floor. And by lowering the floor four meters, lowering the stage four meters, we suddenly have the volume. We can increase the number of audience with an extra balcony. And we get access directly from where the actors come from the dressing rooms directly onto stage. We get side wings for the stage so that the ballet dancers don't have to be caught by stage hands when they otherwise would hit the wall. Uh, we get a lot of space underneath, but it, it, it is an expensive uh, exercise. Uh, but it would also, in this computer, uh, relatively simple computer rendering, give a completely different appearance to the whole. And of course, what's more important, it would give get good sidelines, you get good acoustics, and 
much better facilities for the people who are actually working at the Opera House. And we have these three great ambassadors, the Premier, the Pope and the Governor, debating how we should go about this. And, uh, but it's always a joy to come to Sydney, it's always a joy to see the Opera House and how much people love the Opera House. It's amazing to meet people everywhere in the city say, are you Jan Olsen? Oh, tell your father, tell your father this, tell your father that. And um, I took this last picture from Lady McCoy's chair with Taylor Lynch where people are waving. So with that, I'll thank you. Thank you for that talk. It was so, so fascinating. Can you tell me how old you were when the family left Sydney and um, what your perception was of what had happened at the time? I was, uh, I, we lived in Sydney during my, from uh, when I was 18 till I was 22. So it's, uh, it's, it sits very clear in my memory, of course, because at that age, you go off with a mate, doing all sorts of things, trying to surf, going skiing, uh, going up in the mountains and so on. I drove with a friend across to Broken Hill to Adelaide in a Volkswagen that of course had the front window smashed and so on. I saw all of that, drove along the coast back to, to Melbourne and up the coast here. And so I got a good idea, but we had immigrated to stay in, in Australia forever. So we weren't really in any hurry to go and see the country. And unfortunately, that was cut short. So, um, of course, I regret not having seen a lot of Australia, but hopefully that will be a possibility. Uh, still is a possibility. Um, my father was very good at, well, at least my feeling was, uh, I had a father who came, he was there in the weekends. We went sailing, we went skiing. Uh, we had our holidays. I know his father was very insistent that you should have your time off. You should have your holidays because otherwise your battery burns out. He says, it doesn't matter. If a person cannot live by working hard for eight hours a day, there's something wrong. I know the society has changed now, but it's different. But that was his, he, he said, have a hobby, do something else. Not because you need it other than you need to change what you do every now and again. And I think my father heeded that to the extent that it was possible. I'm sure, I mean, he, he was at the work very often and very long hours as well, but because it was complicated and, and everybody had to work on the Opera House just ahead of the construction team. So that everything was being developed that way. Uh, th thanks a lot. Chris Johnson, uh, Jan, that was a, a fabulous talk. I've always been intrigued with the Opera House about the small shell at the front. I can understand the two halls and the, the shape and the diverse kind of forms and the way it sits on the platform, but to have a very expensive restaurant sitting right at the front doesn't seem to fit with the description you're given of, of your father somehow and the kind of entry point and I'm not sure whether it's about a function or about a signal of arrival. I'd just be interested to understand a little bit about that. Well, I'm actually not quite sure what it, I know it was there and it was shown as a place with with tables outside and it was in the brief there was a request for a restaurant um, and I think my father felt it was a great place to sit up there but later on uh, he's discussed this place for other users uh, because nobody anticipated at the time that it would be such a tourist attraction. Of course, it couldn't be at the time because getting here on a plane was probably half a year's wages. And nowadays, the students that come traveling here, we just had a 120 Danish architecture students here for a month. It's amazing when you consider the cost, but it's possible these days. There was provision in the brief for 90 people working at the Opera House on a permanent basis. Today, there are more than 600. And they fit in the same, same shoebox, if, if you will. Uh, there was uh, a request for 50 parking spaces for cars, which was somewhat underestimated, I guess. 
and, and so forth. But the time was different, and uh, I don't, nobody anticipated what the Opera House would actually develop into. By placing the Opera House where it is today, actually, if I go back in f even further, the debate was whether it should be up at Wynyard Station or at Benelong Point. There were people from the heritage uh, side that wanted to retain the transients as heritage buildings, and we can always discuss what it would have been better, but I, I think that at least uh, Sydney has got somewhat more out of that new project. Uh, but I can't really, uh, Chris, uh, say exactly what the intentions were, except I think it's, it was a function, and by placing it like that, it's part of the sculpture as well. It wouldn't be the same if you took that away. Thank you. Uh, Christine Alexander from the School of English Media and Performing Arts. I wanted to ask you um, if you could say just a little bit more, perhaps, about your father's creative trajectory in terms of his earlier precursors. People, for instance, like Frank Lloyd Wright. I noticed that he was tremendously influenced by him with his first house. But what did he take from his work, for instance, in those early precursors to his later work, which is so much more playful in a way? It is. Um, my father, he took from all sorts of sources, but he didn't use it as, as uh, he didn't use it as such. He used the idea behind it. For instance, when he said at one stage that the opera house is like a Gothic cathedral, he didn't mean anything like it's a church or it's a cathedral or anything. What he meant was uh, like the Gothic cathedral at the time when it was built, it was at the peak performance of what man could do at that time. Uh, the same way as the opera house, the peak performance of what man can do in, it, in our time, or well, back in the 60s anyway. Uh, but he took, always he looked at things and he was very good at analyzing it. He looked at colors from China, he looked at colors from various places and he saw what he liked, he saw combinations, and he was very good at com combining these ideas. When he was inspired by Franklin Wright, it was not everything that Franklin Wright did, but it was mostly his ideas about how human beings should live and uh, uh, the scale of things, the connection to nature, uh, which he also had from his home. The, the I think many of those Chinese and Japanese temple compounds impressed him, not so much by that architecture or the curved roofs or anything, but the way that people approach them obliquely or up steps, going, getting out or getting into courtyards, the way you circulate, the natural way, or the feeling of being there. And that's what he tried to emulate in his, his structures. And that's what I've been brought up with and I've tried in those African projects you just saw a fringe of, uh, to create something where um, a very low cost construction, uh, we can't make a Porsche or a Rolex watch out of those, uh, or that kind of house or that kind of building. There's not nearly money enough for that. But you can take whatever is there and make simple structures and then arrange them in such a way that they become more like a Spanish or a Greek village with all the failings, but you have a beautiful ambience because you sit in different squares and levels and so on, little trees and a bar here and whatever, and it's a very nice place to be, even though the roof is falling down or the walls are coming off the edges and so on. So it's a different concept. Of course, the Baxter Church that you saw, it was a it was long and narrow because there's a road extension planned that would have put the road right up against one wall, and therefore it was closed completely to that side and open to the other side. So there's a lot of logical reasoning behind all his projects. At the same time, there's a kind of uh, Johan Utzon poetry there as well. So you can explain it to some degree, but there's that element of the personality there that you cannot really transport to anybody else. 
Hello. Yes. My name is Varujan Bedrosian from Chartered Institute of Building International. And I would like to say the following. Thank you very much for your father's contribution to Australian architectural faculty. And I would like to ask you one question. How can we use Utsun principles to change Australian councils getting away from the box constructions and getting with Utsun ideas of new ideas in new architectural in Australia? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question and, and your praise for my father. Uh, it, is, it is difficult because an architect doesn't work in a vacuum. Uh, he is or she is a part of a team and part of a society uh, where, where you work together. And it's a co coincidence of a lot of different things that go together to make, that make it possible but that's, of course, one thing. Uh, for instance, when we came back to Denmark from Australia after the breakup with the new government here, uh, my father, he was called to the uh, president of the Institute of Architects in Copenhagen, and he was placed on one side of the table, and I said a lot of people on the other side, and they said to him, it is very bad what you have done. It's very bad for the profession, and uh, a client is always right, you cannot leave a job, and we'll make sure that you never get a public job in Denmark, and he never did. Uh, that's the other side of it. But I think if you want to take my father's work as inspiration, it's probably uh, like he would have said in his later years, always, the the point of departure is always the people who are going to use the place, how they approach it, how they use it, how they uh, circulate in it, um, how, how well it is suited for whatever purpose it is, and how well it is suited for the site, how well it uses that site. Unfortunately, in Copenhagen, a lot of land has been opened for development that was earlier industrial harbour, and for some strange reason, many of the developments have windows up and down the coast, but nothing in the, in the, in the front facing the harbour. And we always wonder, why don't they use the view of the harbour? And there's some idiotic concept of if only some of the people can see the harbour, then not, nobody should see it. <laughs> <laughs> and if you think of what, like my father always did. He took me, for instance, when we were in Sweden, some of the islands, he took me, come on, go on a small island, and he made me make sections through the island for every two meters, draw it. Of course, it's not accurate topography or anything, but by doing that, I learned to look at the islands as the sculptures they were, and I, I learned to notice the shapes, and then he could, by his talking, he could transform those shapes in my head into at a town hall with a covered square in front of it or whatever, or an approach up uh, an incline. Um, he could take me and some of the staff from the, opera, from the office in Denmark onto the ice in winter, which was covered in a thin layer of snow, and we would sort of walk along and set out the plans that we were doing in full size, just to stand there and say, what, what we're dealing with here is not a little thing on a piece of paper. It's actually this size. It's amazing. And that gives you, I think his, he always wanted to see things in model. He said, I can't understand drawings. Of course he could. I can't understand drawings. I, I must see it in full scale. This was also a point of controversy with the new government here because normally when you, when you do a building, you do all the documentation, and then you send it out for tender, 
and the lowest bidder usually gets the job. And in that, you could have prototypes. But my father, he wanted to develop the project. There was no precedence for some of the solutions. So he said, I can't wait for this. I have to make a prototype of a certain size. It can be plywood, it can be anything, but I need to see it full size. And we need to spend some money on that. Um, this was against the way things were done then. Uh, so that wasn't really working. And also, he said, use Ralph Simons to do these plywood things. No, no, we have to make public tender. But this guy is the only one in the world who can do it. Why, why would we bother? And so the system and his thinking weren't always getting along. Um, but I think he, uh, if you look at what we can do in society, if you think, look, I think of it as a, a road. If you follow the center of the road, everything is fine. You, you, do, you don't do anything too dramatic. But if you move to one side of the road, you have fewer customers. And if you move outside that road, it's very hard to get people to see what you want to do. So if you're an opera singer in Greenland, you probably won't have a hope to have a career. But if you go to Italy as an opera singer, you suddenly have an audience. So you, have, you are part of this society. And for better or for worse, you can only go so far. And my father did a lot of projects that went just a little bit beyond what the contemporary society allowed him to do. Two people, there are two people who have been waiting patiently, and I think we might just make the last two questions. I think the gentleman in the purple shirt, and then over to uh, Professor Jing Ran. Thank you. I'm from the Australian School of Business, and I'm a student of architecture. Um, Jan, I'm very interested in... Um, you were talking about the poetry of the, the design earlier. Um, what is it about the design that, when you look at it, I guess you sort of most represents your father? Um, I cross the bridge every morning and can't not look at the opera house. I'm wondering, when you look at it yourself, what does it say about your dad? Well, it's, uh, of course, he was 38 when he won that competition, having necessarily not had that much experience. But he had the, uh, you could say, the excitement and energy and uh, nobody can hold me back kind of attitude uh, at that age. And uh, he was always very positive. He tried to turn everything out to his advantage. And he could generally get people to, to, uh, to, to follow his ideas. It was a great gift for him. Uh, so what I felt was a great enthusiasm, a great uh, driving force, because he was always designing. At night when he couldn't sleep, he'd grab a novel, a novel and sketch in that. So we have tons of books at home where the front two or three pages and the back two or three pages that are normally blank, they're filled with scribbles, uh, even the more uh, important books. And um, he was very entertaining at the same time. And sometimes I sit today with my mother, and we've been so used to having him around telling us stories, and we are nodding at the appropriate places. So we just sit looking at each other, waiting for somebody to say something. <laughs> but uh, no, in the positive note was that he was enthusiastic. He was the first to say, uh, if we came up with something we wanted to do, yes, let's try it. Go and go for it. Uh, and he, he did this very much also to his staff. Uh, he wanted the staff to draw what he had sort of sketched at the table. But they were welcome to do, come up with other proposals as well. And sometimes that, of course, changed things and changed the course of things. He had a, I, don't, I wouldn't call it a problem, but in, in our modern age, probably a problem, because he could always think of something which was a little bit better. So when he, one day on Thursday, he convinced the client, this is fabulous. And the client would say, OK, after a long discussion, this is great. Then the next week, he'll come up with a new one, trying to convince the client again. <laughs> and you can't do that all the time. <laughs> but he was so enthusiastic about this and so sure that what he was saying was right. And with the Opera House, of course, as it was being developed, he just saw so many opportunities to follow the route he followed with the shells, also for the interiors and so on. So he had a whole fan of different possibilities and solutions and so on. So he saw into a universe 
of such things that he was then later able to uh, follow somewhat in Kuwait, a lot more in the Baxter Church, which was uh, pretty much left to his de devices, and very much, of course, uh, in context with we, our, his kids, because we heard of all these things even the, if they hadn't been constructed. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, our last question. Xin Ruan, Professor of Architecture from this university. Uh, yeah, you, you showed a wide range of uh, projects, and that was a wonderful treat um, for us. Uh, but the very last house your father designed in Mallorca, which is not far away from the house you showed in your talk, uh, to me, that is a, a piece of profound architecture. But curiously, that has been given a miss in your talk. I wonder why. Um, well, actually, I left it out of my lecture because of the time frame here. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, it is a wonderful house, I agree. And it is because my parents had lived in the first house that you saw with the niches at the Mediterranean coast. But during winter, you had the storms coming from south. And even though it's 18 meters above water, you could have waves washing up against the rock and sort of sweeping over the house. And it became very moist. So they, they had from early on a site up in the mountains where they then decided to build this house, uh, where they stayed until they couldn't be there anymore because of his physical handicaps. And um, it was, again, a question of designing something like the first house, uh, did the drawings, uh, set it all out, went down there, talked to the contractor, and, and then my father said, ah, no, we should move this a little bit that way, and we should move this a little bit that way, and, and the craftsman then knew when he came along in the morning with two bottles of red wine that they were going to have to change something. <laughs> that was the general, general rule. But, it was partly because in the first instance, the first house that you saw, the, the contractor, he did not understand drawings. We ended up making models that he could follow. And setting out the houses was actually, try to put a block of stone there and another one here. OK, fill this out. Another one over there, fill it out. That they could do. And they did a marvelous job. But they couldn't translate the black and white drawings into a house. And so we said, OK, move it, uh, build up to that height. So many courses of that sandstone. And uh, my father said, OK, stop there. That's it. We're going to put a roof here. So it became a, a, a project in a development, even though he had the drawings. So it was slightly different from the drawings when it was eventually finished. The same with the house up there. It might be time for. Jan and I to sit down and have uh, Richard Johnson close the evening with his reflections on, on Jan's talk. I won't keep you much longer. In fact, there's not much I can say after that. But I think before I reflect on anything, I think I'm sure we all here tonight agree what a great way to launch the Utsun 2010 lecture series. And I think we should thank Alexanas, Professor Alexanas, for his initiative in establishing this series, which has started with such promise. <laughs> Jorn Utsun's body of work spans a half century from the middle of the 20th century to its end. As we've seen, it ranges from simple buildings, individual and group houses, commercial buildings, churches, national assembly buildings, water towers, factories. I kept writing these notes as, I, as the, the, the slides continued. I had no idea of the extent of it. Proposals for museums, theatres, apartments, a stadium, as well as furniture, fittings, light fittings, glassware, tapestries, and even a boat. And of course, his best known work, the Sydney Opera House. Jorn was 
not only an architect, indeed, I think it's fair to say he was a visionary. He drew profound inspiration from nature and from the buildings of many cultures. He was a humanist and had a genuine preoccupation with the way we experience architecture. He always demonstrated a love of materials and craft. And as Richard Weston remarked, he was an instinctive builder who liked to explore the possibilities of materials as a means of giving expression to his ideas. Clearly we've seen all of these qualities in his masterpiece, the Sydney Opera House. This building, we're lucky enough to have gracing our city. As we know, it's been recognised by the UNESCO World Heritage Listing, but interestingly, as the work of a creative genius. But as we've seen tonight, the same genius is evident in his approach to all he did, from the smallest to the largest project or proposal. Tonight, we've been given a rare and more complete insight into his full body of work, his ideas, his way of working, by somebody uniquely placed to do so. Jan, we should remember, is not only his son, but his professional partner for well over 30 years. We've also seen the influence that his father has had on Jan's ongoing work and many of the formative ideas that mould the way Jan practices his profession. We also have to thank Jan for supporting his father and enabling him in the last 10 years to reconnect with his masterpiece and give us a fuller vision of his ideas. We now, as Jan has told us, have a range of documents under Jan's authorship, the strategic building plan, the design principles, his critical inputs into the conservation management plan, all of which will protect and guide this extraordinary building into the future. We have two completed interiors by Jorn, the Utzon Room and the Western Foyers, and stunning new and detailed proposals for the interior of the Opera Theatre. I've, ha I've been privileged to hear Jan talk on his father on a number of occasions. There are always fresh insights, marvellous new anecdotes, and they give us a rare insight, not only to the work of Jorn Utzon, but the man. Would you please join me in thanking Jan for such a marvellous lecture? <laughs>